never gets to be summer. It never gets to be spring. The sun never comes out. In fact, Lewis, in his incredible work, when the Christ image, Aslan, When he comes, spring comes. In fact, they know he's coming because spring comes. And and he's painting for us this picture of the hopeless oppressiveness of the world without Christ. It's always winter, but it never gets to be Christmas. And that's what 2020 for a lot of us is felt like between riots and turmoil in our nation and of course if you watch the news regularly which I don't because I don't want to be told bad news 24 hours a day and that's what news does they'll do one segment on oh here's some good news now back to the bad news because it is let's be honest it is a tv program they care about ratings That's how they make their money. And it's been shown over and over, bad news and getting people riled up gives you better ratings than good news. Here's the hard truth. They are not interested in us knowing the full news. They're interested in us viewing so that they get to charge more money for advertisement based on ratings. But if you've... If you're one of those who needs to watch the news or listen to political stuff or all that all the time, you then have been bombarded and you will be bombarded constantly with negative bad news because that is the drug they feed you to keep you coming back because they care about ratings. In fact, I was listening to a sports talk guy and he was talking about all the brokenness in sports and he goes, listen, as a talk radio, as a sports radio guy, This is the best thing for me. He said, for my profession, I don't want them to fix this. He goes, this is the best thing for me. When these things happen and they're wrong, my ratings go up. And he's being, I'm being honest with you. He goes, so nobody's going to tell you we need to fix this because my ratings go up. I get a raise. And I was like, yes, thank you for at least being honest. And he then kind of joked. He said, now the truth is it doesn't matter that you know this because most of you, if you thought about it, already know this. And it's still going to work. So with an election year, we've been watching the news a lot. We've been bombarded with negative news and negative thoughts. And then with COVID, and we've been bombarded with negative news and negative thoughts. And then we've been told to isolate and to quarantine. And and then we have a controversial presidential election. The second one, it's not the only one that's happened, but it's two in a row where we've had real questions about the integrity of our election. Now, the truth is there's always been question about integrity in our election, but f- for these last two, it's been prominent, prominent questions about our election. And so all of that can pile on, particularly with those who are genuinely worried about a pandemic because they are vulnerable and they are having to quarantine. And so it has felt like for many people, and I would say Almost everybody I talk to, it has felt like always winter. There is this oppressiveness that just has hung over the air. Even if you've said, I'm not going to let this bother me and I'm going to move on. It's still there. Here, here's what it makes me think about. Um, I have a friend who uh, lived in the Midwest and he would talk. He always suffered every winter. He suffered from seasonal affected, affected disorder. He always was depressed during winter because it was just gray for so long. And just the constant grayness. And I would say, in higher things, and he goes, the truth is, things in life are good. But it's just gray. In fact, he bought a sun lamp and they gave him drugs and all this. Because he would just struggle with depression because it was just gray all the time. And he would say, when I look at my life, my life is good. There's no reason why I should be depressed. But I always struggle with depression during this time of year. Because it's always gray. 
And for some of us, that would describe what's been going on. That we look at our lives and we go, life is good. But, but yet still, there is this overhanging grayness. It's just always gray. It feels like the sun will not break through. That though things down here are fine, over this, there's this overarching umbrella of meh. And it's just there. And it's just everywhere I go and I feel it. So it's always winter. And I think about a world without Christ. Where do you turn when it's always winter? Isaiah, the prophet, was writing to the southern kingdom. And for them, it was definitely winter. The Assyrians were sweeping through. And it seemed like no one could stop them. And in fact, there were other kings that tried to get Ahaz, the king of Judah, to join them to resist the Assyrians. And Ahaz correctly looked at the numbers and went, we are not going to win. Now, he didn't handle it well, but he wasn't a man following after God. So he decided, I'm just going to send them an incredible ransom. Just, I'm just going to send them a ridiculous ransom, hoping they'll just accept it and leave us alone, which they didn't. The people were carried off into captivity. But Isaiah's writing, and in fact, Isaiah's writing to people already in captivity. People who are going to be in captivity, people in, already in captivity, and then his writings also apply to those at the end of captivity. But in the middle of Isaiah writing to these people who are truly desperate, the southern kingdom at this time, are, they are feeling the weight of winter, if you will. From chapter 7 to 12, he turns their attention to hope. That there's going to be, from God, one who will deliver them. In chapter 12, he says that he tells them about a virgin that will give birth, and his name will be called Emmanuel, God with us. And so he's letting them know it looks bleak. It looks like there's no hope. The winter's here forever if we use C.S. Lewis's imagery, which I am throughout this sermon. But there is one coming from God, Emmanuel. God with us. And then two chapters later in chapter 9, which is where we're going to be. We're going to be, we're going to look at Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. You're very familiar with these verses. If you want to go ahead and turn there, they're going to be up here. But he continues to speak of this hope from God in the middle of, in the middle of winter. Now, they have, the Israelites at this time, have no concept that God would come and live with them. So they are actually looking for a man, a man in the line of David. And so many of them are probably thinking, what's well, going to be a has a son, Hezekiah, but Hezekiah is not a man who walks with God. He doesn't even turn to God to the end, to his deathbed. And then, and he dies while they're in captivity. So it's not him. In fact, for 800 years, the people of Judaism are looking from the prophecy of Isaiah. They're looking for the one that will come through the line of David that will be God with us, that will be this man that will set us free. But look, knowing then that context, look at what he writes. And we'll, like I said, we'll just look at verses 6 and 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. To us, Jesus, is, Jesus wasn't an accident. It, was, it wasn't a random thing that happened. He was given to us. To us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called. So he's saying that God is going to give us Salvation, is that the right word I'm looking for? He's going to give us 
one that will rule over for eternity. He's going to give us one in the midst of us worried about this conquering, vicious nation that's dominating everyone. In this world where we are weak and small, we are the southern kingdom of Judah. In this world where we no longer are this great nation that we were under David and even under Solomon. In this world, God is going to give us one who will rule. The government will be on his shoulders forever and ever. And so you imagine these people reading that and filled with hope. And then it, it, for 800 years, they're constantly reading this, looking, going, God is going to deliver us in this winter. Because if it's not the Assyrians or the Babylonians, it's the Greeks and it's the Romans. They're constantly being dominated by people. And so they're reading, going, but God is going to give us. God is going to give us. One in the line of David that will rule over forever. The government will be on his shoulders. He will rule forever. And so Isaiah is giving them this hope. They don't fully understand it. They don't fully interpret it correctly. We wouldn't either have, were it not for the Holy Spirit and the Lord explaining his scriptures to us. But for 800 years they are looking for the Messiah of God. And this is one of their primary passages going, he is going to give us one who shall rule. And then he describes, he gives him the names he'll be called, and these names are descriptions of who he is. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, of the increase of his government, and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over the kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. What hope when it feels like it's always winter? In other words, to continue with the imagery, Christmas is coming. It's not going to always be winter, people of Israel. It's not always going to be winter, people of Navarre. For them, it's Christmas is coming, and for us, Christmas has come. So, Lucy's words to the world without Christ is absolutely correct. Always winter, but it never gets to be Christmas. But those are not her words to us. Because we get to say, it feels like it's always winter, but Christmas has already come. Christmas has already come. So I want to remind you, the goal of this sermon is to remind you that it feels like it is always winter. It feels like 2020, that there has been this gray cloud over everything. But Christmas has come. And because Christmas has come, then this coming Christmas Day, we celebrate. It is a celebration of what has already happened. Christmas has already come. And I know some people get caught up, oh, was Jesus born on December the 25th or not? And I go, I don't care. That is not the point. The point is that Christmas has come. Jesus has come. The wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace has already come. God with us has already come. So this winter as we're going through, and I don't know how much longer it will last. We all talk like as if, you know, December 31st it ends. And then January 1st we're like, oh, New Year, 2020 is over. It's going to be great. And I hope it's going to be great. But it may be winter. It may be winter all the way through 2021. It may be winter through 2022, through 2023. In fact, there are some people who have lived their entire lives in winter. Winter. 
But that didn't mean they had to live winter without Christmas. Christmas has come. And because Christmas has come, we can endure the winter. Because Christmas has come, the winter doesn't defeat us. So let's look at the name, the names given to this child that is born, to Jesus. He says that he will be a wonderful counselor. That's a good English translation. And by the way, it is wonderful counselor. I know that some of the printings of the King James Bible put a comma there. And so everybody now goes wonderful and then counselor. That's actually not in Hebrew the way it is. It was just a a printing error that became the norm. Uh, By the way, if you go, oh, then that changes the Bible. The first few printings of the King James Bible left out the... Uh, thou shalt not in the Ten Commandments. There were several printings that said thou shalt. You know, printing errors happen and they got corrected. So your modern translations will say wonderful counselor because here is how we would translate that. If I were translating those Hebrew words and, and I've read several who have said that, said wonderful counselor is a true and faithful translation. It's just the way we now use wonderful. Perhaps a better way for us to understand is this. Indescribable, ununderstandable wisdom. Wisdom that we cannot comprehend. Wisdom that we cannot describe. That kind of wisdom. And so I tell you, during this time of winter where there's this gray cloud over us and it feels like spring's never coming and it feels like we're never going to see the sunshine and we're never going to get to run and frolic through the lilies or mow our grass you know I mean we're because I'm thinking I don't want to frolic through this anyway um, it feels like none of that's ever going to happen because it's always going to be winter there's always going to be this gray cloud and we're we're hoping that a vaccine is going to do it or that the legal system is, is going to fix problems we're hoping these things are going to happen we hope if we just say the right phrases or do the right things that the tension is going to go away and I'm just going to tell you it may always be winter but that doesn't mean for those who know Christ that it's always bleak in fact as we live in a world that may be feeling the weight of winter we get to say Christmas has come and in that Christmas there is an indescribable wisdom that is with us Now, this wisdom, then, I want to encourage you as you're walking through winter, encourage myself even, as we're walking through winter, understand that God with us means there's an indescribable wisdom with us. Now, this wisdom does not necessarily pertain to whether we should wear a mask or not. It doesn't pertain to whether we should quarantine or not. I'm going to trust you to handle that however you best think you should handle that. We have a lot of medical people in our family, and they're very divided on, you know, what do we do? We get the vaccine or do we not? We have some who have, and we have some who haven't and won't. They're all MDs. Some who wear masks and some who don't, and they're all MDs. I mean, you have to make your wisest decision on that. Should you quarantine or should you not quarantine? There are those who say we definitely should quarantine and others who say the damage done from quarantine and being alone is actually greater. That's not the wisdom we are talking about. The wisdom we are talking about is is how do I, in in the middle of winter, how do I function in a way that is aware and walking with God with us, the Lord Jesus Christ who is with us. How do I walk in that kind of wisdom? So when we're in the middle of winter, we have to go, you know, my ideas and my thoughts are my ideas and my thoughts. What does the Lord say? And we may turn to Philippians 4.8 that says, think on these things. And so we start filtering our thoughts through that. Is it true? Is it honorable? Is it pure? Is it just? Is it lovely? 
Is it excellent? Is it praiseworthy? As I begin to dwell on these things, Scripture tells me to capture every thought for Christ. Now, primarily that's talking about every argument against God, but capture every thought for Christ. Am I then turning to the wisdom of God in His Word and say, God in His wisdom has given me His Word that I should be thinking on these things? Am I thinking, do I have a filter on which I filter my thoughts that I'm going to dwell on? Or am I allowing my mind to just dwell on whatever it wants to well, that's unwise. So I turn to the indescribable wisdom that is with us, and I say, what do you say about how I should be thinking? And I'm just using one example. But Christmas has come, which means for us, winter is not defeating. Because Christ is with us. And he says he's an indescribable wise one giving wise counsel he is the wonderful counselor and he is the mighty God he has power over all things there's nothing that exists that does not exist by him and for him nothing that exists and that thing that exists exists for his glory his purpose his will now does that mean he wills all sin no but understand everything is under the preview and the purview of God he sees it before it happens he sees it while it's happening and it's under his authority did that mean I understand everything that God allows no but I am confident of this there is nothing that happens in the life of a believer that the Lord did not first weigh and allow. And I would even turn to Job. Righteous Job. How does the book of Job open? Satan is given a report to God. The adversary is before the throne of God giving a report. If you think Satan and God are, e are equal, if you think somehow there's you know, some equality of battle going on here, you're missing all that Scripture teaches about the sovereign power of God and the created being that we know as the adversary. Hasatan means the adversary. We call him Satan. What we're really saying is not that is your name. We're saying that is your title. That is your role. Your title and role are the adversary. You are the Hasatan. You are, you are the adversary opposing God and all of what God is doing in God's people. But the primary enemy of Satan is not God because who can be the enemy of God? It is the people of God. That's why we battle not against flesh and blood. We battle not against flesh and blood. Satan understands his role. So in Job, Satan comes before the Father and he's giving a report. Because you can, you can not like God all you want, but you understand authority. That's why when Jesus says, get out of the pigs, they don't go, well, you're our enemy. They go, uh, can, or get out of the man. They go, hey, is it okay if we go into the pigs? Like, can we compromise? Would you let us go into the pigs? And Jesus is like, yeah, I'll allow it. So nowhere in Scripture do you get this equal battle between Satan and God. And so Satan reports to Job. And God brings to Satan's attention Job and says, have you considered Job? And then Satan goes, well, he's only that good because you won't do this and this. And God goes, I'll allow you to do this. You can make him sick. You can, you can kill all of his, you can take all of his wealth away. I'll allow you to do that. He's still going to worship me. And he does it. And he comes back and he's like, what about Job? And he's like, ah, well, that's because you've allowed his, you know, his family. That's well, okay, I'll let you, I'll, I'll let you do that. Well, it's health. I'll let you take that. Do you understand everything that's happened to Job? Satan has to go before God and get permission to allow that to happen. Why? Because he is the mighty God. He is the mighty God. I may not understand all that he does. I may not can explain in a way that any of us are comfortable with what he allows. 
But here's what I can stand firm on according to Scripture. He is the God who rules all things and nothing is outside of his power, outside of his rule, outside of his authority, outside of his ability. There is nothing that happens. There's nothing that can happen. There's no molecules. It's often put by some theologian. There is no random molecule in the universe that is outside of God's purview or power. He is the mighty God. So as we are walking through winter, because Christmas has come, we go, yeah, winter seems oppressive. But God rules over it. At any time, God can sweep the the clouds away. Do I understand all that the Lord is doing? His ways are mysterious to me. Does that change the fact that he rules over all things and he is the mighty God on whom I can have confidence? Uh, talking to somebody, it wasn't about COVID, this is a long time ago, I was talking to somebody about unexpected death and things that happen, and this person said, I don't understand all the ways of God, but I have full confidence that Scripture says he numbers his days. He numbers our days. And so the fact that this weird, unexpected thing happened, I trust the Lord in that. For he numbers our days. And I'm like, yes, that is unsatisfactory to so many of us because we want, no, no, I have to fully understand. I have to fully be able to explain. And I would just communicate to you that either God is the mighty God who rules, who created, and who is over everything, which means you and I cannot comprehend his ways or his plans, or he is not. Because if you and I can fully comprehend even his purposes, he is not mighty God. He may not even be pretty okay, God. He might just be, eh, God. Because most of us don't get how most things work. And yet we demand of the mighty God that we understand everything. And what I want you to see is because Christmas has come, not only do you have wisdom that is incomprehensible available to you through his word and his spirit in you and I, but we also have confidence that he rules over all things, that nothing surprises him, that nothing is outside of his control, nothing opposes him in such a way that he is defeated He is the mighty God. So I can have absolute confidence in the mighty God. And this mighty God is everlasting Father. See, he could be incomprehensible wisdom and all-powerful, omnipotent God and be a tyrant. But the way Scripture describes him is, is he is the everlasting Father. He will eternally be toward us our Father, those who are in Christ. So as we go through winter, we don't go through being dominated without hope. We go through going, but my my everlasting Father, who is my Father through Jesus Christ, my everlasting Father is with me, and He has all the power, and He has the wisdom to give me what I need now to be wise, to think as I should, to turn to Him. He has the wisdom for all of that, and He is my everlasting Father. And He's a better Father than the best father we know. You may have had a great dad. So when you think of God, you go, oh, yeah, God's like my dad, but even better, which is I'm pretty sure how Piper thinks. Like, you know, like there's dad and then there's, oh, just you, just like dad, then God, right there. <laughs> that's how in my mind I imagine it. I'm pretty sure that's not actually true. But the truth is, is even the very best dad among us is way down here. And our perfect, everlasting father is infinitely up there in that separation. He is perfect, perfect in love and in care, perfect as a father. And he, according to the scriptures, has committed to his people to be an everlasting father. So as we're going through the bleak winter, we realize my father cares about me. That's why he even says in the New Testament, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. 
He cares about me. And maybe it feels like he doesn't. In fact, I'd like to speak for a moment to those that we have a few people who have to watch us over the internet because they are vulnerable. And for many of us, we don't feel that vulnerable to COVID, and so we're able to be a little more cavalier, and good for us. I, I, I am not for a world that quarantines the healthy. Seems like a thing we've never done before. But we have to remember there are people who in the wisdom that God has given them and what they've heard and the best decision they can make, they have been quarantined for months. They are alone. And so however hard it's been on us, and everybody I talk to, there's been a level of feeling of being just a disoppression. Sometimes we can't even name it. It's just gray. It's just winter. There are some who for them, it's not just gray and wisdom. It is a nonstop blizzard. And they're really, really in winter. And so I just want to encourage you guys now, continue to turn to Christ. And even in your own mind, when it can feel like everybody else has abandoned you, because that's what solitary does, that's what being um, confined does. It can make us start thinking that everybody's turned away from us. Christ is your everlasting Father. Turn to Him. He never stops caring. And the truth is your church has not stopped caring for you either, but it can feel that way. And we don't want you to feel that way, but please know, turn to Jesus. And many of you have, and I want to say thank you for that. He is our everlasting Father, and that's what we have to do. We have to turn to Jesus. We have to go. The care of my soul belongs to Jesus. Christmas has come, and then he is the Prince of Peace. The result of all of that is, as he says there even in Isaiah, he says that his, the peace would run, his, uh, there would be no end to his peace. So let's pick up verse 7. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore the zeal of the Lord will the zeal of the Lord of the host will do this what does he say there's no end to his peace now this government and justice but yes but no end to the not just justice no end to the peace the result of christmas coming is that even in winter there is peace you and I can have peace in winter. We can have peace. Even when it feels like there's just nonstop clouds. Even when it feels like it's in a blizzard. Even when it feels like we are alone. Through Christ and in Christ, there is peace. He is the prince of peace. And in his kingdom, peace rules. And so you may be going, but I don't, I don't feel at peace. I think of what Jesus told the disciples. It's, I think it's John, I don't know, like 14, somewhere in there. But he says to them, because they're not feeling peace, and he says, my peace I give to you. Or peace I give to you, not as the world gives, but my peace. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Let not your hearts be troubled. What is his answer to the disciples whose hearts are troubled? He says, I am giving you peace. But maybe, maybe not, you're maybe thinking about peace the way the world thinks about peace. And what I'm telling you, I'm giving you my peace, which is exponentially better than the world's peace. I'm giving you my peace, so don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Where do we find that peace? In Christ. And so if I am ever feeling a lack of peace, I find the answer to be always 
to turn to Christ. Who is my everlasting father? So that means I can talk to him like my father with full confidence of his power and authority of rule, knowing that his word and his spirit give wisdom. But the result is peace. That's why Paul writes that a fruit, one description of the fruit of the spirit, there's one fruit and then there's nine ways it's described, this one fruit, the working of the spirit. And one of the ways we would describe the work of the spirit in us is peace. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. All of those are the fruit of the Spirit. We don't just pick one or two out and go, oh, I have that one, but I don't have that. No, all the Spirit working in us results in all of these. And one of the ways it results is peace. And so I have to go. If in the middle of winter I am feeling no peace, is it because I forgot Christmas has come? I don't know how long it will be winter. I don't know how long it will be gray. I don't know how long it will feel oppressive. But here's what I know. Christmas has come for those who are in Christ. Christmas has come. The Lord is with us. And with him being with us, we are then with wisdom and power. And care. He cares for us. And we are with peace. And you know what? I don't know how to do that. Turn to Christ. Turn to his word. Become obsessed with him. Here's a challenge. Are you in his word as much as you're in the news? Are you listening to his word and to those things that point you to Christ as much as you're listening to those things that create in you a lack of peace? Are you dwelling on his word as much as you're dwelling on your own thoughts, your own fantasies, your own imaginations of what should be done and how things should be handled? Are you dwelling more as much on Christ as you are those things? Are you capturing your thoughts for Christ and saying, Lord, as your child, as your servant, as the one who knows you, as the one who has experienced Christmas in this winter, Lord, I capture this thought and say, my own thoughts don't belong to me. They belong to you. Let me think your thoughts after you. This is how we experience Christmas in the winter. He has come. Christmas has come. And because Christmas has come, we can have joy and peace in the middle of winter. We can have it. Will we turn to Christ? So Dwayne and the worship team, they're going to come and they're going to lead us in songs about Christmas. The first set were to remind us of looking to the hope as Israel was looking to the hope. But now we get to go joy to the world. So let's stand and sing. And when you sing, I want you to sing understanding. Maybe this Christmas is different. Maybe it feels great because you can't see mom and dad or you can't visit with family. And maybe you're just overwhelmed with how bad it is and how weighty it is. And I want to tell you that that it is legitimate to be bothered by all of that. But don't let that rob you of your focus on Christ. And be reminded as we sing, Christmas has come. And because Christmas has come, we all have hope. We all can have joy. Because God is with us, even in winter. God is with us. So we're going to sing the hymns, and then when we're done, if you'll just pray and amen us out of here.
so thankful that Christmas has come, that even through the storms, even through winter, that our hope still remains bright, that the government is still on his shoulders, that the Lamb of God who was slain was risen from the dead and has completed the work. God, we thank you that uh, we can partake in and marveling at your glory, that we can partake in, in seeing your work done here on this earth. We ask you that you continue to use us, continue to bless us, continue to build us up to do your will, continue to grow us together as a family. We thank you for the season. We thank you for this time. Um, we ask you that you would... Uh, Shine your light through us. That we will be salt and light to this earth. God, I pray for everyone in this room and everyone that's watching at home. Have your hand on their lives, God. Keep them. Give them joy. Give them peace. Give them hope. In your name we pray. Amen. You guys can be dismissed.